Great. All right. Well, welcome to Grand Rounds. Thank you all for um, venturing out here in a, a cold, gray, a bit rainy, snowy, icy day. Um, appreciate it. And for all of you online, I hope you are staying warm and safe. So I'm delighted um, to introduce our two very special um, lecturers today. Um, we have uh, uh, the, the dynamic duo um, from Hospital Medicine. I'm first going to introduce Dr. Farah Kaxo, who is a rising super, superstar in hospital medicine. So she has an interesting background um, as I was going through her CV. Um, she received her BS uh, from Georgetown in Foreign Service and International Affairs, which to my interpretation is training to be a spy. Um, <laughs> She then went on to get a master's in public policy from UCLA before turning to medicine, where she got her MD here, University of Wisconsin, and then um, decided the winters were a little too brutal for her and went down to Tulane University, um, where she completed her residency in internal medicine and stayed on and was selected as chief resident, uh, including um, the chief resident for quality safety uh, initiatives at the VA there. We were able to lure her back. Um, to Wisconsin, uh, where she came as an assistant professor in 2016, um, initially at the VA, and then we pulled her over to the university side. Sorry, Alan. Um, okay. And uh, she has really blossomed into, um, you know, an outstanding rising star investigator um, with a focus on uh, health equity. She has a longstanding research interest in health equity and has been uh, interested most recently in or uh, culminated in a K-23 application really focused on improving the health of older incarcerated adults. Um, and I think that's gonna be scored in- Oh, that's scored this week. Okay. <laughs> Good. 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 Okay, good. We're, ex we're excited. Um, and she's built a really uh, wonderful collaborative team uh, for that project. Uh, she has received a numerous honors. Um, she was selected from a pool of um, amazing applicants nationally to uh, be part of an editorial fe fellowship at the um, Journal of Hospital and Medicine. And after completing that fellowship, she was actually selected to stay on as an uh, associate editor. Um, she was also appointed to a panel from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, on a commissioned paper to address uh, the inclusion of minorities and women in clinical research um, and was recently appointed on the research committee for the, so the Society of Hospital Medicine. Um, uh, she really is a rising star um, in hospital medicine. Um, so we're delighted to have her accompanied by a, a star, a superstar in hospital medicine. So I will spend a few minutes on Dr. Sheehy. So um, as all of you know, Dr. Sheehy has served as our division chief of hospital medicine since 2010. And she really has been an exemplary leader and role model within the Department of Medicine, the School of Medicine, the health system, the university and the nation. Um, she is a nationally acknowledged leader in hospital medicine and her achievements in medicine and their importance rank her among the leading researchers and clinical administrators in the discipline. And I say this because we just put together her promotion packet and that's what the, all of the external reviewers are saying. So it's not just me. Um, under her leadership, the hospital medicine program has flourished. Uh, it has, uh, I don't even know the word, quite, it's more than quadrupled, 500% increase in um, faculty in hospital medicine, um, has built a multidisciplinary team within hospital medicine and mentored many of the junior faculty, um, including Dr. Kaxo. Um, her research uh, is fascinating uh, and um, has focused on healthcare policy. So um, while be, while uh, at, at UW, she noticed um, a, a Medicare coverage loophole that impacted one of her patients and decided to e explore that further. Um, and this single patient encountered began her research study into our uh, Medicare hospital observation policy and associated audits with that policy. Um, 
uh, lots of digging into it, publications, policy, uh, publications, editorials, et cetera, um, culminating uh, many publications in Journal of Hospital Medicine, JAMA Internal Medicine, Mayo Clinic, et cetera. Um, and she, because of her nationally recognized expertise, she served as an expert witness in a case, Alexander versus Azar, um, in which she uh, testified or provided evidence for the plaintiffs. And that helped solidify a victory for um, Medicare beneficiaries in the federal court. And so, you know, I, I dug a little bit to really understand what this meant. So prior to this ruling, it meant that if a patient was admitted to the hospital under observation status, which is not under their control, um, and if they later subsequently needed, for example, a, a, a skilled nursing facility, et cetera, they were then subjected to enormous financial bills and had no recourse um, to complain to address this. Uh, and Dr. Sheehy's research showed the arbitrariness and the inequities that this policy has led to. And because of her research and her, uh, her, her expert testimony, as well as a, a body of other work, um, that uh, it was a victory for the plaintiff. And that the, um, the class suit that, that was won is estimated to contain hundreds of thousands of beneficiaries with claims going back to 2009. So really impactful work. Um, as many of you know, she was selected to be one of 16 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellows, um, so she spent the past year in Washington, D.C., and, um, you know, she, she had a, a, a small role uh, and was only assigned to Nancy Pelosi, who really um, had no visibility in the past year. Um, but I think it says a, a ton about um, Dr. Sheehy's um, value and, and recognition. Um, she has come back and is continuing her policy work in health disparities with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation for CMMS and currently serves as Associate Director for Health Policy Research at Cheddar with Dr. Kind. Um, she has, uh, I'm not even gonna go into everything that she does. I will point out the, the one thing that I find um, actually very interesting is her role in um, as a faculty athletic representative to the Big 10 Conference and the NCAA. Um, and she, uh, uh, manage that during COVID. And I'm sure I would love to have been a fly on the wall for those meetings because I'm sure there was no egos involved and <laughs> no discussion of finances. <laughs> um, but with that, I am absolutely delighted to invite Dr. Sheehy and Dr. Kekso to talk to us about using healthcare policy to advance health equity. Well, thank you, Dr. Schnapp, for that lovely introduction. I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, so I will move our slides along here. Oops. Oops. Oh, it's not active. Gotcha. Okay, great. Perfect. There you go. Um, so it's also a great privilege to be presenting with Farah today, um, our talk, Health Policy to Achieve Health Equity. We have no disclosures. And this is the outline we'll follow today. I'm gonna to speak about health professionals and health policy and use the Inflation Reduction Act as an example of that. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Farah and she's gonna talk about the intersection of incarceration and health, specifically an overview of incarceration in the United States and Wisconsin, federal, state and local policies and best practices for caring for incarcerated patients. So health policy directly influences the world in which our patients live and policy decisions made each year in Congress impact the world in which we deliver care and how our patients receive it. It can be legislation, regulation, or through the courts, all of this is health policy. And policy can be helpful or harmful. So let's compare two policies from the last century. So first, Medicare. Most of us are familiar with Medicare, but what many may not realize is that when Medicare first became law in 1965, persons over age 65 were the most likely to be living in poverty and the least likely to have health insurance. So Medicare truly created a lifeline for elderly Americans that exists to this day. 
On the other hand, historic redlining occurred in the 1930s when the Federal Housing Administration mandated segregation and even subsidized builders who excluded Black Americans, resulting in disadvantaged neighborhoods that persist to this day. And we all know via Dr. Amy Kind's work, the neighborhood disadvantaged, the exposome, those exposures that are external to the biologic human are linked to a wide range of health outcomes. So both of these policies have tremendous lasting impact on our patients today. And these are just two of the examples of thousands and thousands of policies that have such impact on healthcare. Of course, it's important to always issue a reminder of how we can operate in the policy space as UW Health or SMPH employees. Here, SMPH acknowledges the contribu contributions we can make as SMPH employees but it is clear advocacy must be done on personal time and with personal resources. Now, there are many exceptions to this policy and rule. In my case, my academic work is very policy focused. So I give talks like this on advocacy and policy. And there are other opportunities to represent UW Health and SMPH on certain issues. You just need to be sure you have the right permissions. And I'm not gonna focus more on this, but happy to take questions after our talk. Great. Great, thank you. Um, so if health policy is important, then training opportunities are critical. And I don't know about you, but I had very little policy training in medical school or residency. I think things are better now, but um, from my standpoint, I had a deficit um, coming into my uh, faculty role. And fellowships are one way to obtain training. So I'm gonna describe my experience as a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow last year. So I lived in Washington, DC last year and spent three months in intensive training, sort of a crash course in health policy, followed by eight months working in Congress as a health policy staffer, in my case, the Office of the Speaker. This requires near a complete relinquishing of daily campus duties as activities may be a conflict of interest, but also because you just simply don't have time to do campus-based work. So this is my cohort of six fellows, um, which are selected each year for a two-year cycle. Um, it, in my case, it was three physicians, two nurses, and one social worker attorney. And part of the richness of this experience was this amazingly talented multidisciplinary cohort. And I say two years because um, as Dr. Schnapp mentioned, I'm still technically a fellow and I have a 20% appointment working for Medicare. If on the right, um, if interested, this article, um, it was published by the AAMC this fall and describes all sorts of mid-career fellowship opportunities like my fellowship, also the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Program, the White House Fellows Program, Supreme Court Fellows and others. So what does all of this have to do with equity? Well, we see problems patients have firsthand and being able to articulate to policy members um, during my eight months in Congress was impactful, but now back at UW, understanding how advocacy and policy works, um, it helps me address these issues for the rest of my career. So this is gonna feel a little like me showing my family vacation pictures. <laughs> so bear with me, but I thought that showing some photos was probably the best way to share what the fellowship experience was like. So um, this picture on the left is my team. Um, Wendell Primus is, was the, the speaker's senior health policy advisor, and he's on the far left. He was my day-to-day go-to amazing mentor, role model, and will be a friend for life. And then obviously I had the privilege of working for uh, Speaker Pelosi, who was uh, an amazing leader. Um, so this um, on the left shows the, my work room. So I was, um, I worked on the fourth floor of the Capitol, that was my office. And the fourth floor of the Capitol is kind of the attic of the Capitol. And so there's no windows. And so I was perfectly positioned to excel there because I've spent my career working in G-Med work rooms and hospital medicine work rooms that have <laughs> no windows. But the advantage in Congress is people bring their dogs. And so this is George Michael and he came to our office often. And so I would just say, you know, if I could pick windows or pups every day, I would pick pups hand down. So I was pretty much in heaven. Um, and then this is um, me on the top of the Capitol. We got to do um, dome tours um, as staffers and hear about the history of that wonderful um, and historic building. This next picture is um, from the speaker's balcony. And this is, um, we sometimes after a long work of legislation would have happy hour on the speaker's balcony. And obviously um, there's probably no better place in DC or maybe the country to have a happy hour. 
I did do some real policy work here. Um, so this was, um, I got to represent the speaker's office at the White House Summit on the Future of COVID-19 Vaccines. So this was a room of about 100 people. And um, you can see on the left, Tony Fauci at the podium and Ashish Shah in the other picture. And this was on that same day. Um, this is me outside the West Wing. And this was my badge that day. I think I peaked that day. It's all downhill from here. I was at the White House uh, representing uh, the Speaker's office. And then I will say our, our fellowship was very federally focused, but we did do state visits. And so this was our fellows in Albany, New York. And so we got this really neat behind the scenes state experience where we got to meet with a state Medicaid director, um, the Department of Public Health, their um, insurance exchange, their marketplace uh, leadership. And so really very um, impactful and interesting. And we also took a trip to Puerto Rico and learned about um, healthcare in the territories. And then this picture on the bottom is, um, there. this was a night called the Fellowship of Fellowships. It was us, the Supreme Court Fellows and the White House Fellows. And this is FDA Commissioner Califf. So there was about 30 of us. And the commissioner just sat on this stage wearing his suit and tennis shoes and just talked off the cuff about the FDA. So really amazing opportunities to learn in those settings. And then finally, um, this fellowship really helped me gain perspective on the entire policymaking process. So on the left is me in the Capitol Rotunda with a group of members of the Society of Hospital Medicine, which is my professional organization. And they were in Washington as part of their fly-in day or their hill day, talking with elected officials and their staff, which on that day, I was the staff. Um, it, it was amazing um, over the course of this year, though, to see so many health professionals, from students to residents to, to nurses, PAs, researchers, clinicians, all taking time to share what their patients and professions needed. And for me, it was a little like therapy because so many of them came with stories from the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was incredibly grateful for those bringing messages to Congress, having lived through that myself. And on the right is a picture from Statuary Hall on the second floor of the Capitol, just like the rotunda, which was two floors down from my office. And on this day, there was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And as a Title IX beneficiary myself, I had an athletic scholarship in the 1990s as a woman, which would not have happened 20 years earlier. This event was a strong reminder that things we take for granted today were once hard fought in the hallways of the Capitol and Congress. So in this photo you see off in the distance, there's a woman in purple at the podium and that's Billie Jean King. Um, so just an incredible opportunity to walk down a couple of flight of stairs and attend inspiring events like this. So I'm gonna to flip to um, a spe specific example of legislation that I worked on that had many health equity provisions. And I'm gonna to try to take you a little bit behind the scenes to describe how policy actually gets done and what it looks like in the end. So this was the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA, which was HR 5376. And just to make sure everyone's on the same page, all of the house bills come through as H.R, House of Representatives bill, and then the bill number, just like the Senate bills come through as S. whatever bill that number is. And then now it's PL 117169 because it's law. So that's public law. And then the 117th represents the 117th Congress, which is the, the years that I worked, which are the years 2021 and 2022. So now we're in the 118th. So this passed uh, the Senate August 7th, passed the House on August 12th, and President Biden signed it into law on August 16th. And this was a huge budget reconciliation bill with large climate, drug pricing, and AC marketplace provisions. So today I'm only going to talk about the drug pricing provisions just in the interest of time, but I thought it'd be important to describe a little bit more about this bill. So what is a budget reconciliation bill? So to understand the significance of this type of a bill, it's important to understand how bills actually get passed. So this may be very basic for many of you, but just to level set, um, in the House of Representatives, a simple majority um, of House members, 218 or more, are needed to vote in favor of a bill to pass it. In the Senate, actually, a simple majority is also required to pass a bill, so 51 senators or 50 with the vice president breaking the tie, but it takes 60 votes to invoke cloture or to stop a filibuster, so in essence, 60 votes are needed to pass a bill in the Senate, except for reconciliation bills, so they're not subject to the filibuster, so in a 50-50 Senate like we had last Congress, budget reconciliation bills represent a unique opportunity to get omnibus legislation done. The caveats are that only a limited number of these bills can be passed each year, and they can only contain elements re related to the budget, so things like spending, revenue, and debt. 
And this is because of the so-called Byrd Rule, which passed in 1990 and is named for Senator Byrd. Um, and because of the unique nat nature of these bills, i.e. not subject to the filibuster, Senator Byrd insisted that these bills be limited to these elements that are germane to the budget. However, there's no way, obviously, that Senator Byrd and his colleagues would have known in 1990 what senators would want to put in a reconciliation bill in 2022. So they left that decision up to the nonpartisan parliamentarian who has the sole discretion to decide what is germane and what's not. So for example, in the IRA, initially this bill contained a $35 monthly copay cap for insulin in the Medicare program and for all commercial insured patients. The parliamentarian said the commercial insurance provision um, did, uh, could stay, but that the commercial, the commercial insurance component did not meet the bird rule. So it was thrown to the bird bath and people actually do use that term. So um, senators can um, try to then reach a 60 vote threshold for something the parliamentarian discards. Um, and that's indeed what they tried to do with the commercial insulin provision, but they only garnered 57 votes. So the final pass bill only contains the insulin provision related to Medicare beneficiaries. So this is a picture from the House floor. I was on the House floor on August 12th when this passed. You can see up in the corner, it's HR 5376. And um, we have just crossed 218 votes. There's 220 yay votes up there on the wall. And then you can see in the, um, the House chamber, all of the votes lit up on the wall. And in the distance, uh, there's a woman in yellow. That's Speaker Pelosi at the podium. So as many of you remember, the 2000 presidential election cycle was full of debates touting a prescription drug benefit for seniors. And indeed in 2003, under the George W. Bush administration, Medicare Part D was created as part of the MMA. And just to level set again, um, so everybody knows, uh, Medicare Part B covers drugs that require medical services like infusions typically. And Medicare Part D covers the vast majority of drugs we think about like beta blockers, statins, et cetera. But under pressure from the pharmaceutical industry uh, and others, when the MMA passed, price negotiation was prohibited under this non-interference clause. And I will just say that obviously I was not in Congress at that time, but I can guarantee the bill they hoped to pass included drug price negotiation, but the past bill represented necessary compromise to get it across the finish line. And you see at this timeline on the bottom though, that it's taken almost two decades to pass legislation allowing for drug price negotiation following the MMA. And this is really, again, this beside, behind the scenes way that policymaking works. And sometimes it's timing, momentum, or a st specific makeup of Congress that's needed to advance certain legislation. <clears throat> so this is just a table of the top Medicare spend for drugs in 2020. And so at the top of the list is Eliquis or Pixaban, um, at, initially FDA approved in 2012, and that becomes relevant in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Total spend is uh, about 10 billion, B, billion with a B, uh, yearly dollars of Medicare spent on Eliquis. And it gets on this list because of a very high number of beneficiaries and a fairly high um, price per beneficiary. Second on the list is Revlimid, uh, again, 2005 FDA approved, and um, the total spend is about $5 billion uh, in the Medicare program, and it gets on this list for a reasonable number of beneficiaries, but really this very high um, spending price tag. So why is this an equity issue? Well, how many patients cannot afford their medications? So many Medicare beneficiaries still don't have Part D, or they have monthly copays for meds they need that are not affordable. So with Eliquis, this is information from one of my favorite Medicare beneficiaries, my dad, um, who allowed me to, um, he has on Eliquis, and so he gave me this information to share. So obviously a few points here, um, despite the fact that price negotiation was not part of the original bill when Part D became law, it's obviously been enormously impactful for patients because $6,000 a year for a single medication is just not possible for the majority of beneficiaries. But it's worth noting that even with Part D, Eliquis costs more than $500 a year in out-of-pocket costs. So there is still a long way to go in improving drug pricing. And keep in mind that most people that are on Eliquis are going to be on other drugs. So this is a good reminder to all of us that having insurance does not necessarily equal affordability and our patients may still struggle to pay these out-of-pocket costs. So this was a fascinating time to be in Washington as there were lobbyists and ads all over the place arguing for and against the drug pricing provisions. 
So against price negotiation, um, Pharma, P-H-R-M-A, is the largest pharmaceutical lobbying organization, and the Pharma president and CEO said, this bill, the IRA, will decimate the hope of curing cancer and other deadly diseases. So for me as a physician, that statement is very impactful and concerning because I want to cure cancer and other deadly diseases, just like everybody else in this room. <laughs> and I th think that resonates with a lot of people. Um, and they spent a lot of money carrying that message. So $283 million were spent in 2022 with over 1,700 lobbyists. And this data is on a website called Open Secrets, which publishes all sorts of lobbying dollars. I encourage people to go look at it. It's actually very eye-opening. But there was a counter message for price negotiation and the House Committee on Oversight and Reform published this report that said from 2016 to 2020, the 14 leading drug companies spent 577 billion on stock buybacks and dividends, which was $56 billion more than they spent on R&D over the same period of time. And, and there was a strong counter campaign carrying that message by the AARP and others. So these top two panels were from pharma. Um, politicians say they'll negotiate medicine prices in Medicare. What politicians mean is they'll decide what medicines you can and can't get. Tell Congress, don't play doctor with your medicine. And then the bottom panel is just um, AARP. They were relentless in continuing to buy ads, urging Congress to make history, allow Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices. So the IRA passed, and um, this is a very busy slide from KFF, but this is um, the timeline of the prescription drug pr provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. So while drugs won't start to be negotiated until 2026, many of the cost provisions have already started. So as of January 1 of this year, drug companies cannot raise prices faster than inflation, which is a significant change and will, I hope, will hopefully slow the growth of uh, pricing increases for patients and for the Medicare program. The insulin copay cap that I discussed has already started, um, and then um, all recommended vaccines are now free to Medicare beneficiaries without copay or deductible. Other specific patient provisions include increased low-income subsidies in the Part D program starting next year and the $2,000 out-of-pocket cap in Part D, which is very impactful. Thinking back to my dad paying $552 a year for his Eliquis, add a few more medications, and that $2,000 cap could be very helpful. So again, this piece of legislation works to reduce medication costs to Medicare beneficiaries, which hopefully helps more people actually afford and take their medications and receive vaccinations. <laughs> Switching back to a little behind the scenes policy information, you know, it's important to point out that just like when Part D was created and drug pricing was excluded, likely as a product of negotiation and compromise, the Inflation Reduction Act is also a product of negotiation and compromise. So the drug pricing components of the Inflation Reduction Act began as part of HR3, which was passed in 2019 in the 116th Congress. And just a little bit more behind the scenes information, when you see a bill number under 10, those numbers are typically reserved for leadership priorities and are high priorities to pass. So HR3 passed the House in the 116th um, as a, one of Speaker Pelosi's uh, main priorities, but it did not pass the Senate, and so it needed to be reintroduced in the 117th Congress because all, because all bills that do not pass in a particular two-year cycle need to be reintroduced. And so these drug pricing elements were initially uh, included in the Build Back Better Act, which passed the House in fall of 2021, which is what the Senate took up in August of 22, renamed as the Inflation Reduction Act, which is what the House eventually passed and became law. But the IRA re represents compromise and negotiation from the initial HR3 bill. So HR3 actually was gonna save the Medicare program $515 billion, whereas the Inflation Reduction Act saves only about 200. Still incredibly impactful, but $300 billion, billion with a B dollars left on the table. And the reasons are this, because HR3 was gonna allow for negotiation of 50 drugs per year, whereas the IRA is 20. HR3 applied to the commercial sector, whereas the IRA doesn't apply to the commercial sector. And HR3 allowed negotiation of drug prices right out of the gate, whereas the IRA allows for nine years for the drug uh, pharmaceutical industry to recoup costs prior to that drug able to be negotiated. So as you remember, um, Eliquis um, was initially FDA approved in 2012, so they could be subject to negotiation. Uh, um, and so many of the drugs are really in this window already, but that delay does create some reduction in, um, in savings. So you can either look at this and say, my goodness, look how much we left on the table for pharma. Or you can say for the first time ever, 
we are we have the ability to negotiate drug pricing. And I think I fall on the latter side just now understanding how policy making works. And hopefully it's not gonna take us another two decades to improve on this piece of legislation. But I think um, I think this will be something that is legislated and improved on over the years. So in summary, um, health professionals, I think, really need to be engaged in health policy to achieve health equity. And fellowships are a way to gain experience, but there are many other ways. And so please come talk to me if you're interested. The Inflation Reduction Act is an example of work relevant to our patients and our profession. But like most legislation, the final pass bill represents negotiation and compromise. But I do believe the door is finally cracked for drug price negotiation. Um, and there's strong provisions to mitigate out of costs uh, for patients. So lots of thank yous to the foundation for selecting me for the fellowship, to my cohort of uh, fellows, to the speaker's office, um, UW Health and the department for supporting me in this year, my division for also bearing with me being gone this year and just having a, I just, we have the best division. I, I feel like I'm so biased, but we have an amazing division of hospital medicine and to Cheddar for giving me lots of opportunities coming back here. And so I will turn it over to, uh, to Farah. Uh, thanks, Anne. Thanks for letting me present with you. You're always a hard act to follow, and I fear that my portion is not going to be quite as fun and funny. Um, but my goal today is to build on Anne's example of the IRA and give you additional examples of policies that impact the health of incarcerated patients. I also hope to make the case that incarcerated individuals are a vulnerable population made up of a disproportionate number of poor and minoritized individuals. And this group lives at what my colleague Kristen Murs brilliantly described as an epidemiological crossroads in which their demographics put them at risk for bad health before incarceration and how some of the current policies that affect them during incarceration exacerbate that risk. And then lastly, I'm gonna offer some quick suggestions on how to care for these patients when you see them in your practice. So many of you probably know the United States is the world leader in incarceration, both in terms of absolute number, about 2 million people and per capita, a few different countries like to jockey for number two, but we're consistently number one. And as you may have guessed, there are quite a few countries between Australia and Cuba on this list, but I wanted to show some comparison rates for countries we generally consider to be similar to ours. According to the American Action Forum, which is a center right think tank, the cause of this high incarceration rate is not high crime. Crime has been decreasing over the past decades. Instead, it's issues of poverty and overcriminalization of offenses that do not lead to incarceration in other countries, particularly nonviolent drug offenses. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition, almost 25% of the people incarcerated in the US are pretrial and are being held because they can't afford bail. Across all the jails in this country, there are nearly three times as many people being held pretrial as have been convicted. And nearly 75% of these pretrial detainees are being held for nonviolent offenses. In total, the American Action Forum estimates that almost half of all the people incarcerated in the US are being held for nonviolent offenses or crimes related to poverty. Here in Wisconsin, we rank about in the middle of the states when it comes to our incarceration rate. We have about 40,000 people incarcerated on an average year, more than half of whom are in state run prisons uh, run by our Department of Corrections or DOC. And of the 13,000 people in Wisconsin jails, about half are held pretrial. We also have significant inequities in who is incarcerated in the United States. So this image shows the racial and ethnic breakdown of the overall US population on your left and the incarcerated population on your right. The most notable imbalance is the underrepresentation of white Americans and the overrepresentation of black, Latin, Latino, and Native Americans. Here in Wisconsin, the inequities in Black, Native, and White American incarceration rates are even more stark, as you can see. This data is actually from 2010, but unfortunately, things haven't changed much. This image is from the Sentencing Project, and it uses data from 2019. And as you can see, Wisconsin is one of two states in the country where the Black to White incarceration ratio is greater than 10. It's about 12. In fact, as this WPR story from 2021 describes, Wisconsin imprisons one in 36 black adults and no state has a higher rate. In addition to racial and ethnic disparities, there are significant socioeconomic inequities in who's incarcerated. In terms of income, this data is from the Brookings Institution and illustrates just how poor most incarcerated people are, 
with more than half earning less than $200 a year in the two years prior to incarceration, and another 30% earning less than $15,000. Adults living in poverty are three times more likely to be incarcerated, and homeless individuals are 11 times more likely. And as I mentioned previously, poverty itself is a common reason for incarceration. In addition to an inability to afford bail, many people are held because of an inability to pay fees or fines, some of which are actually related to the legal process itself, including filing fees and court fees. And in almost all states, individuals can be charged for room and board during incarceration. Along with inequities in income, there are associated inequities in education level, with this image showing how formerly incarcerated people are far less likely to have a high school degree, have had any college, or have a college degree. So the inequities in faced by the incarcerated population in terms of race and ethnicity, income, education, they extend to include their health. People who are incarcerated face higher rates of almost every medical condition. A lot of attention in this area is focused on infectious diseases, mental health, and substance use disorders. And certainly this population has higher rates of these conditions. So this data is from 2011 to 2012. It actually comes from the US Department of Justice and shows just how much uh, more prevalent these infectious diseases are among people in state and federal prisons. People with mental health conditions are overrepresented at about two to four times the overall population. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse estimates that almost two thirds of incarcerated people have an active substance use disorder. Again, this is probably not surprising to many of you as we're frequently taught and frequently reminded about the increased rates of these conditions in incarcerated populations. But what about these conditions? This 2009 paper compared a national sample of incarcerated people to non-incarcerated and found increased odds among incarcerated individuals of hypertension, asthma, arthritis, and cancer. And this is even after adjusting for age, sex, race, education, birth country, marital status, work, and alcohol consumption. Again, perhaps not surprising, but also perhaps not something we frequently think about when we take care of incarcerated patients. As a hospital medicine provider, one of the populations I'm particularly interested in because they make up so many of the people admitted to the hospital is older adults. Like the overall population, the number of older adults in prisons and jails has been increasing over the past couple decades. And this image ju shows just how explosive that growth has been and that growth has continued since 2016. You may be wondering why adults age 55 and over are included in this rather than, than the traditional 65 year old cutoff. And here again is another example of an area in which incarcerated people are at a disadvantage. Incarcerated individuals experience what's called accelerated aging, the process in which exposure to incarceration speeds up biological aging. Several studies have demonstrated this effect, this effect and as this population grows, the issue is getting national attention. So an example is just a USA Today article from about a year ago about a study that was done in Iowa. And the extent of the accelerated aging is pretty impressive. A 2008 study found that older adults in jail had higher rates of geriatric conditions such as falls, medical, morbidi medical comorbidities than the overall population. And that these differences remain significant even when comparing the incarcerated population in red to, to non-incarcerated people uh, in the lowest quartile of net worth, which is orange. Overall, these researchers found that incarcerated adults reach the same level of geriatric comorbidity at age 59 as non-incarcerated people reach at age 75. Here at UW, we've started looking at the characteristics of the incarcerated patients we care for in the hospital, which is a population of about 500 people per year, and found that incarcerated patients in every age group have higher comorbidity scores than the comparison group of non-incarcerated. Beginning at age 50, actually, incarcerated patients we take care of at UW are sicker than non-incarcerated patients age 80 and over. So to come back to the idea of an epidemiological crossroads, uh, I've tried to paint a picture of what one could think of as the individual level factors that impact our incarcerated patients. Now I'm gonna move on to some of the policies that govern the care of these individuals. And for those of you who grew up in the States, I'm gonna throw you back to fifth grade and review the Bill of Rights, specifically the Eighth Amendment, which is the restriction on cruel and unusual punishment. According to this 1976 Supreme Court decision, Estelle v. Gamble, individuals in law enforcement custody actually have a constitutional right to healthcare. Specifically, Estelle orders access to care, 
requires that correctional systems make it possible for patients to receive care that's been ordered by a, a health professional and ensure that healthcare decisions are made by health professionals only. Implementation of this constitutional right, though, varies significantly across the country. There's no national regulations or requirements. At the federal level, the Bureau, Bureau of Prisons offers clinical guidance on everything from acne to Zika. That's my one joke. Um, <laughs> but this guidance applies only to the 10% of people that are incarcerated in federal facilities. And that while the guidelines are pretty good, they're guidelines only, and there's little data to show how closely they're followed. Healthcare for the remaining 90% of incarcerated people is governed by policies and laws at the state and local level. And I'm gonna give some of those examples in a minute. But first I wanna mention a recent federal policy change that has the potential to positively impact older adults when they're released from custody. As of January 1st of this year, individuals released from incarceration are afforded a 12 month special enrollment period in Medicare. Prior to this change, they had two options. They could continue paying their Medicare premiums while incarcerated, despite not receiving any benefits because Medicare doesn't pay for incarcerated people, or they could choose to disenroll, but then would have to wait for a special enrollment period to re-enroll and may have to pay higher premiums. Shelby's shaking her head. Um, alternatively, if they don't know that they have to disenroll or they're unable to disenroll, but they're, but they're incarcerated long enough that their Medicare coverage gets suspended, then they also have to pay late fees and back coverage for the months that they were covered, even though they don't get any, but that's, that's over now, that's done. Um, it remains to be seen how this policy change will impact the care of older Medicare eligible adults, but it's a step in the right direction. At the state level, one policy that impacts the health of patients we see is the use of co-pays. Almost every state requires some co-pay for patient initiated care. And here in Wisconsin, it's 750. At first glance, this amount seems reasonable, certainly less than I pay when I go to the doctor, but when considered in the context of the wages that incarcerated people make, these co-pays are unaffordable. This image normalizes the cost of correctional care co-pays to what a person making minimum wage in each state would have to pay. So here in Wisconsin, asking an incarcerated person to pay 750 is the same as asking someone making minimum wage to pay $600. And in seven states, the ones here on the far left, they're kind of grayed out, the equivalent amount is indeterminate because people in that state can be forced to work for no pay while they're incarcerated. And there's good evidence that co-pays, regardless of the amount, have a detrimental impact on the poorest and sickest Americans. Perhaps the classic study on this is the RAND health insurance experiment, which is the largest health policy study ever done in the US. RAND found that cost sharing reduced the use of healthcare without significantly impacting health among patients of higher socioeconomic status. While free healthcare led to improvements in the health of, health of the poorest and sickest Americans. So Rand's conclusion was that cost sharing should be minimal or non-existent for the poor, especially those with chronic diseases. There are many more recent studies that have similar findings. The details are beyond the scope of this talk, but the overall message is that copays can have negative unintended consequences for those already at risk for poor health outcomes. Last year, WPR published a story about these unintended consequences in our state. And this report tells the story of a man who more than two years after his release from prison was still paying off the medical debt he had racked up during incarceration. And high copays not only have implications for patients themselves, but can also have financial consequences for the system by costing more in the long run and public health consequences if untreated illnesses are allowed to spread. And speaking of untreated illnesses spreading, our state's approach to COVID also provides another example of relevant state policy. Early evidence from the summer of 2020 showed that incarcerated people faced a rapidly increasing risk of COVID and three times the risk of death compared to the overall population. By early 2021, half of all people incarcerated in Wisconsin state prisons and 2,000 DOC employees had contracted the virus. This was the same time that the vaccine became available and the State Department of Health Services planned to include incarcerated people in phase 1B of its vaccinations, which includes people in congregate living settings. However, a bill was introduced in the state legislature that would have prevented incarcerated people younger than 60 from receiving the vaccine until 21 days after it was available to the general public. This topic was an issue of an op-ed um, that Kristen Merz and I co-authored for the Wisconsin State Journal in February of 2021, where we argued that withholding vaccinations from incarcerated people was both unethical and bad public health policy. 
I bring this op ed up as an example of one of the ways that we as healthcare experts can advocate for issues and patients in our capacity as private citizens, as Anne discussed earlier. Ultimately, the, bill, the bills became irrelevant as the legislature didn't move on them in a timely fashion, and the vaccination plan progressed. So at the local level here at UW, we have a clinical policy that details how we can interact with incarcerated patients. The full policy is longer than this, and it's available on UConnect. And I'm actually just going to talk about Part I in, um, in the interest of time. So Part I addresses law enforcement restraints or shackles. And this is another area that I'm building my research program around, given the known negative consequences of restraints in older patients in the hospital. As physicians, we have the right to request that law, enfor law enforcement restraints be removed if we feel they're compromising the health of our patients. If there's disagreement between a provider and a correctional officer, the issue can be passed to the medical director of the forensic unit, which happens to be me, and the, <laughs> and the DOC liaison, and we can find a solution. The DOC ultimately has a uh, final say as they're the ones responsible for everyone's safety, but you should be aware that there are cases where you can and perhaps should ask for law enforcement restraints to be removed. Here's another op-ed, this time by a critical care physician from Vanderbilt, and it details how he and his team were able to get this leg shackle removed from an intubated COVID patient. The correctional officer at the bedside actually didn't feel he had the authority to remove the shackle, so the team faxed a message to the DOC stating that removal of the shackles was needed for medical purposes, and within an hour, the shackle had been removed. This case is, of course, an extreme one, but there are many cases where non-intubated or general care patients would benefit from having their shackles removed during hospitalization. These are just some of the many policies that impact the health um, and health care of incarcerated patients. And like Anne, I believe that how we shape these policies has the potential to positively impact this group. And I also believe that at the provider level, we can perhaps mitigate some of the many inequities faced by this population. So now I'm gonna very quickly mention some best practices for caring for these patients. The most important thing to remember is that incarcerated people have the same amount of personal autonomy as other patients. Loss of medical decision-making rights is not part of a prison sentence. Patients with capacity have the right to make their own medical decisions, including bad or potentially life-threatening ones. And just as with non-incarcerated patients, healthcare providers are the ones who decide capacity. The process is exactly the same. Patients without capacity have the right to have an appropriate surrogate make decisions for them, and law enforcement staff are never appropriate surrogates, and in some states they're explicitly banned from serving as such. And finally, surrogates should be granted visitation rights when needed in order to help them make medical decisions. Even when this goes against the rules, exceptions can and should be made. This image, uh, which we recently published in the Cleveland Clinic Journal, uses the best practices I just mentioned to take you through making a plan of care with an incarcerated patient both with and without capacity. This paper is actually based on an actual case that my hospital medicine colleague Deb Patel saw at UW. The patient was brought in from prison with a hemoglobin below a trans the transfusion threshold, and the DOC had a court order that authorized blood transfusion. The patient refused. Dr. Patel determined that the patient had capacity and understood the risks of his refusal. Because the patient also had a history of self-harm, she actually had psychiatry do an additional evaluation, and psychiatry agreed that the patient had capacity. So transfusion was deferred despite the court order. Important to note that court orders are very rare and even more rare are cases in which courts have compelled treatment of incarcerated patients with decision-making capacity. Providers such as ourselves, uh, people who do not work for the Department of Corrections are very unlikely to face these situations. And it's also important to note that a court order that compels specific treatment of a specific pa patient does not compel a specific physician to provide that treatment, at least not yet. The Wisconsin Supreme Court just a couple weeks ago heard a case about whether providers can be compelled to provide ivermectin to COVID patients. So we'll see where that lands. Um, but for your purposes, it's very unlikely you'll face a court order and even less unlikely that you'll be compelled to administer treatment. And if you are presented, feel free to contact me or the UWSMPH legal team. So to sum up, um, I've tried to show that, these, that there are significant inequities in who we incarcerate, that the incarcerated population is made up of vulnerable individuals, many of whom come from underserved groups that many of us went into medicine with the hopes of helping. Some of the policies that govern the care of these patients, such as the use of co-pays, have created structural barriers to good health. In contrast, some policies like the Medicare special enrollment period may begin to break down some of these barriers. 
And finally, we as providers can have a positive impact on this vulnerable population through the care that we provide. And before we open it up to questions, I want to quickly acknowledge the work of Ramaya Whiteside, who died unexpectedly last month. Ramaya has been with many years in the Wisconsin Correctional System. I never actually met him in real life because of COVID, but um, since his release in 2019, he worked to help support people both during incarceration and after. He was the associate director of Expo, which is a group in Wisconsin that works to reinstate voting rights for people who, are, who have been incarcerated. Sorry, I can't believe I'm crying at Grand Rounds. Um, I'd also like to thank, these are the many organizations that have been kind enough to work with me on this issue. And then many thank yous to all my mentors who I've listed alphabetically because I couldn't possibly rank them. Thanks for your attention. Great, thank you for really an impactful Grand Rounds. And, you know, I think for me, the other take home uh, a lesson is um, how well both of you have uh, used a scholarly approach to um, healthcare policy um, to, to really carry out the Wisconsin idea, which is improving the health of everyone in our communities and our regions. Um, and I applaud you for that work. So, We are open for questions, and, and I think there are some online. Okay. So wait for the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, that that was really great, both of you. I really uh, appreciate and admire the work you guys are doing. Um, Sorry, this is a little nerdy, but this concept of um, accelerated aging, I think, is super important. And yet, you know, there's all these research things that you could theoretically do and yet, frankly, can't do yet. So, like, as a practical physician, what's the best way to determine someone's biological age? Is it, like, how fast they stand up or is it, you know, what their Fitbit says I have I have no idea, but 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 I think this is real biology, right? Um, I don't know. Do you guys have thoughts? I mean, I, obviously there are geriatricians in the room who can answer this better than me. And I think, but for me, practically, I mean, the most important thing to know, and we see this all the time, right? Not just with incarcerated people, but that the number on the um, on the page doesn't really represent anything. Um, we have so little information on, like Anne said, the exposome and neighborhood disadvantage and things like that. So I almost feel like the age is becoming irrelevant at this point. But for incarcerated people, um, it's important. Sorry. Relevant it's relevant to you. Yeah. And as I get older, it's relevant to me. But um, yes, um, for incarcerated people, I would say age 50. So there's kind of the general consensus is that age 50 and above is considered elderly aged. So uh, sorry, sorry, Rob. And I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to paraphrase from uh, one of the questions um, for both of you. Maybe Anne can start. Um, how do you see uh, um, health inequities and healthcare disparities being incorporated into policies um, and legislation? Are, how how is the lens of health inequities being used? Yeah. So thanks for that question. I I do think that you know, most, I didn't talk about some of the other aspects of the IRA, for example, but, you know, there were additional subsidies for the marketplace um, so that nobody would pay more than 8.5% of income in um, health insurance premiums. And so I think, I think there's a recognition that, I mean, we focus a lot on cost of care because, you know, insurance is obviously necessary, but not sufficient to deliver health care. And so I think chipping away at some of those cost provisions and making sure things are targeted um, to the right, uh, to the most vulnerable patients is important. I will also, I will I point out, um, you know, CMS and my work with CMS and Dr. Kine knows this very well. So ACO Reach, which UW is a part of, is now um, adjusting the per beneficiary uh, per month um, benchmark adjustment based on Dr. Kine's um, ADI. And so that is really going to be impactful. So hopefully more dollars will flow to the most disadvantaged people in the country. And I think so. I think those things are starting to really uh, be found in health policy more broadly. 
And I would just say quickly, I think the, the creation of the Medicare special enrollment period, I mean, for those of you who know Medicare, 12 months is a huge special enrollment period, right? Like that's a big advantage for people. And I think that's because the, you know, we've recognized that the people who are incarcerated, first of all, they frequently go in and out of incarceration. Um, and secondly, they often are people who may not have access to other resources. I want to thank both of you uh, for really uh, inspirational uh, overview. Your advocacy is uh, is really impressive. Um, question uh, for you, Anne. Um, in the world of academia, we we consider uh, evidence drives decisions. However, we we do have a sense that that's not always the case in other areas of uh, of practice. Uh, so I'm I'm curious. From from your observations during the time as a, uh, a fellow, how did evidence for like healthcare matters influence some of these important decisions that you were a part of? I mean, I'm just curious. You know, I, undoubtedly there was an influence, but I'm but I'm sure it was uh, filtered somehow. Yeah, that's a filtered is a very gentle way of saying it. <laughs> um, I will say that so there were lots, and this is where I thought constituents coming in and talking was um, really impactful to kind of highlight priorities. But we also um, had access to lots of external um, kind of advisors, especially in the speaker's office. So, you know, people that were at think tanks or people at academic medical centers, we we talked to them frequently about issues that we would call people up and ask, what do you think of this? Like, what is, what is you know, where's the best place to land? But ultimately, you're right. And I, I got more comfortable with this as the year went on. You know, I, I went to Washington thinking like, I like love health policy, pure health policy. And one day I was kind of just getting queasy about changes we were talking about. And one person I was working with, they were like, Anne, like, if you want to talk about the most perfect health policy, like go work at a think tank, but this is Congress where politics is a necessary part of passing legislation. So I think to summarize, I would say that you hope that it's based on the science. You reach out to the best experts that are available. You listen to constituents coming in, but ultimately there is an influence of politics in any uh, past piece of legislation. And I just kind of, I actually grew to kind of appreciate that a little bit more as things things went along, so. Okay, from from the uh, online folks, um, can you talk about how the policy changes you mentioned applied to Medicare Advantage, or thoughts on Medicare Advantage in general? We have lots of thoughts on Medicare Advantage. <laughs> yes. um, so I will I will say that there is a um, RFI out right now that's with comments due on February thirteenth about applying the uh, traditional Medicare or fee for service Medicare standards to the MA programs because although they're supposed to follow through the conditions of participation uh, with um, Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare standards, there have been some deviation from that and not a lot of um, enforcement. So, um, so yes, there, there's a we could go on for for a long time about the Medicare Advantage uh, plans, but I think that there's a recognition now that there needs to be uh, more transparency, more um, kind of similarity, at least um, how this. Um, this RFI is, is worded. I think there's a recognition of that now. So feel free to look up our papers on the issue. <laughs> and we'll show you what we really think. Yeah. <laughs> Great plug. Um, another interesting question. What is the data about adherence to medication in um, incarcerated uh, individuals? I mean, the data is while they're incarcerated, it's excellent. Um, there was just an article in uh, a paper from out of Green Bay from two days ago, or maybe, maybe it was Monday or Tuesday, about a 61-year-old man who um, held up a bank in a very gentle way in order to get his medicine. Um, so meta within, yeah, to go back into the prison system so he could get his medicine. Um, so the there's a lot, again, there's not nas national stand. Well, there are actually national standards by a national organization, but none of the prisons or jails are required to follow those national standards. So every prison has its own formulary. A lot of different states have their own formulary. But within prisons, most people have access to the medications that they need, um, at least most of the medications that they need. It's when they leave that, you know, a problem occurs. I just have a question to try to blend both of your presentations <laughs> is um, would you are there any policy recommendations at the state or federal level that you would identify as benefiting or 
impacting the outcomes for uh, uh, justice-involved individuals? I mean, I think getting rid of copays would be such an easy one. Um, yeah, that's probably the the most straightforward one. Uh, there's there's so many things we could do in terms of like HPV vaccination in the prisons and things like that. But the the one that's and quite a few states have gotten rid of copays. Actually, there were like five before COVID, and then during COVID, quite a few states suspended their copays and have kept those suspended. Um, I don't know if the, what the data is on that, but that seems to me to be a very simple one. Um, an interesting question about uh, clinical trials. Um, in many clinical trials, uh, incarcerated individuals are ex uh, specifically excluded as being viewed as a vulnerable population, um, and uh, yet that robs them of the opportunity to benefit um, from clinical trials and, uh, um, and their autonomy. Can you talk about uh, how do we incorporate uh, incarcerated individuals into clinical trials and thoughts on that? I mean, it's, uh, it's of course a very complex, um, complex issue and complex question. I am not a, a clinical trial expert or a medical ethicist, um, but I think, like you said, there is increasing recognition that exclusion um, is does not is not in their best interest necessarily. Um, and I will say, I have not had. Um, People say, oh, you know, work, if you're going to try to work with incarcerated people, the IRB and this and that, it's not that bad, right? The DOC has their own IRB and they, and you have to get their permission and then you get UW permission. Um, so I think, I don't think it's impossible. I think people are just scared to do it for, for good reason, but you know, that's when we have to push the envelope a little bit. Yes. So what you're saying is, is because the admi increased administrative burden. Um, and the fear and of being considered. Yeah. yeah. But we're trying, aren't we? A bunch of us are trying. So. Okay. Okay. Hey. Um, there's a bunch of questions. Um, can you talk about? Let's see. Let me. In the we we're right out of time. So, how can we as um, healthcare providers be the most effective lobbyist for our patients? Um, what what makes a good um, advocate for our patients in DC for our within um, our state policy makers, et cetera. Go ahead. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think there's many ways to, to do that. I think having some basic, you know, kind of policy knowledge about what's kind of going on in the, in the world of policy. But in general, I think effective, if you're going to be going to visit and talk to our legislators, um, is having kind of a patient specific example in mind why this is important to the individual patient. And if then if you have data that you can support, I mean, I think um, um, I, there was this one office that has a sign in, 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 um, in one of the congressional offices that I was in several years ago, and they had a sign on the wall that said, in God, we trust all others bring data. And I still remember that as it was kind of a play on words, obviously, but um, I do think being able to articulate the importance to a patient having the patient at the center of the issue you're advocating for. And then if you have data to support, it's probably, that's probably the ideal formula. Okay. So I'm going to paraphrase storytelling backed up with data. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. With that, we are over time. I apologize for a number of the questions that we were unable to get to. I am sure Dr. Sheehy and Dr. Kaxow would be delighted to um, take additional questions um, later. So thank you all for your attention. <laughs>